and that's really a big topic, and we will probably only be able to cover some aspects, some small aspects in these uh, 45 minutes. Modular systems have become more abundant in the last years, and um, everybody is talking about object-oriented programming uh, that is beneficial, but um, didn't deliver on uh, the promise of real code memes. And modular <coughs> systems uh, seem to be uh, a better solution to <coughs> tackle this problem. So different approaches have been taken um, to, uh, to, to ease that, to make it simpler to reuse parts of your application like aspect-oriented programming, dependency injection, or real modular systems. Um, and today we'll talk about uh, some techniques, helpful techniques, if you want to uh, modularize your software. But first, I'd like to introduce myself and my co-speakers. My name is uh, Anton Eppler. I'm from Appleton IT Consulting in Munich, and we're doing, um, uh, we're doing training and consulting, mainly related to the NetBeans platform and uh, also OSGI. And um, I'm also a member of the NetBeans Dream Team and the NetBeans Governance Board. And as such, we're doing free trainings all over the world at universities. And we, uh, for example, were at the University of uh, Belgrade, where I met uh, Soran Shevaraz. Um, he's, for, uh, he's there at the Faculty of Organizational Sciences. And he's leading the development of Europe which is a very popular and powerful platform, or IDE, for working with neural networks. Maybe you would like to say a few words about... Okay, thank you. Uh, as Dan introduced me, my name is Zoran. I work at the Faculty of Organizational Sciences. I work uh, there in the Laboratory for Artificial Intelligence and also as a teaching assistant. Uh, I'm the founder of the Neuro Project, which is actually a neural network framework. So we have also uh, some uh, application with user interface and recently we started porting it to the NetBeans platform after receiving the training from Tony and Ketchup on NetBeans and uh, we think that it's a really big step for our framework. Uh, I may say that uh, maybe th that it is the most popular framework in that field, in the field of uh, uh, Java and neural networks and uh, we think that porting to NetBeans platform is a really big and important step that will bring our projects to the next level. So today I will talk to you about our experience in porting the uh, Swing application to the modular architecture like the NetBeans platform. So this will basically be our case study and uh, we will have uh, some, we'll get some insights from him about the before and after. And uh, over there, this is Jaroslav Tulak. Um, he is the founder of NetBeans and um, also author of a book on um, practical API design. So um, would you like to say something about your role in NetBeans? And, uh okay, so I will um, say that uh, sometimes I feel that uh, I've been thinking about modularity before it even happened, before it began. Definitely I'm thinking about modularity since uh, the day when we started to work on NetBeans project and uh, uh, started to create the NetBeans platform. Um, I'm, that happened 12 years ago, probably, since during that time I've seen a lot of important milestones for modularity. And I'm glad that I can be here because this session is an important milestone. Tony promised to reveal his five principles of modularity and I'm really looking forward to know what they are. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot for this. <laughs> so Jelle will go into a bit more detail about service retrieval, about declarativeness and uh, uh, practical impact, impacts on performance. And he's also uh, leading the, I think you're leading the performance team in NetBeans? Uh, yeah, I've been working on performance uh, of NetBeans ID for the uh, uh, last three years. And actually, I think uh, I can s talk about some patterns related to performance and modular systems. Okay, and you will share his insights from working with different modular systems. 
quite recently uh, he has been working a lot with OSGI and uh, also with a, with another um, well with another system for it's not really a module system but it's uh, a JSR 198 for IDE and interoperability mm -hmm. which also has some uh, um, some aspects of, of, of modular system or some aspects of modular systems so but now let's talk about uh, patterns in general so patterns are by definition something like a general reusable solution to a commonly occurring problem in software design and um, well the Gang of Four introduced some uh, some patterns, uh, more or less formal descriptions, and these have evolved over time. And when you're going about to apply these patterns, uh, you will see that uh, a lot of these patterns depend on context. That means, um, for example, some patterns are only useful, or, or you only need some patterns for, for certain programming languages because other programming languages have constructs, uh, uh, constructs that uh, render them useless because uh, the language covers uh, the problem. But also the phys physical design matters. So uh, when we're talking about physical design, I mean, how, how you package your application, how you um, package, uh, uh, how you put your classes in different bundles, for example, or different modules, and if they're organized in modules. So when creating modular applications, there are some commonly occurring problems. That is, for example, um, especially how you can uh, reduce dependence between uh, the deployment units and how to make them um, uh, cohesive and how to make them easily maintainable, how to reduce dependencies, and also how the parts, different parts of the application communicate with, e with each other. So, um, especially those parts that are uh, developed independently. So for, as a simple example, if you create a desktop application, you will probably have a menu. And you, if you want to give people uh, the possibility to extend this user interface, you want them to contribute menu items. But you don't, uh, as the creator of the application, have access to their source code, to their code base. So there needs to be a different way of communication uh, than in a regular monolithic application that you create uh, from, uh, from the web. So we are looking for the patterns that help us with these problems. So obviously there are some good places to look for solutions because there are some, uh, uh, some frameworks around, some platforms around for quite a while. Like for example, the NetBeans platform has been founded, Yarda, help me out, 11 years ago? The the platform? 11? Mm, 1997. So that's 13. 13 years ago. And that's probably around the same time as the uh, OSGI spec uh, uh, evolved. So they they um, were created around the same time. And, and now in the last year, Spring has gotten very popular, which also uh, takes some approaches in dependency injection to solve some of these problems of communication. And um, we want to discuss those. We want to have a look at those, especially at the service infrastructure later on, and discuss which uh, uh, which of the patterns that they are using are useful in what context. Because it might make a difference, for example, if they are used on server or desktop. That's the reason why we earlier asked uh, who of you is using desktop and who of you is uh, using server applications. So, but in order to discuss um, uh, patterns, we need some criteria to evaluate them. So um, the first criterion that I would like to propose is uh, maximizing of reuse. That's one of the most important reasons why you go for a modular design. You want to maximize reuse. Next thing is related. The related point is to minimize the coupling between uh, parts of the application. And the next criterion is especially important uh, to modular design uh, to be able to deal with change in a sensible way. So if you have, um, if you want your application to be extensible, uh, you will have uh, third parties using your APIs. And uh, in a monolithic application, it's very easy to deal with change because you can change all the parts that use your API. But in an application where you have third party contributions, that's not possible. So for example, if you, if you look at um, JDeveloper, they will probably be, it will probably be easier for them to uh, 
make an incompatible change to their APIs than, for example, for Eclipse, where there are thousands of, of plugins out there. Um, another related point is to ease maintenance. And, um, for example, in NetBeans development, um, each development, each release has a certain theme. So the theme is, for example, in the last release, the theme was to add OSGI support. And uh, in order to be able to concentrate um, on, uh, on one certain part of your application, it's very important that you can control how the, the other parts of the application are influenced by it. So um, it, should be, it should be easy to maintain the parts of the application. And um, another criterion is to ease extensibility because we were talking about that applications need to be um, modular applications that used to be created to, be, um, to have plugins, to have additional mod modules that can be plugged into the existing infrastructure. And um, it is important that you have a powerful mechanism to create extension points and uh, to have a simple mechanism to create extension points. <coughs> so it, it doesn't stand in your way. And last but not least, it's important to save resources because um, um, those solutions that you have should not really affect uh, uh, startup time or the memory footprint. <coughs> so uh, because we're dealing with large systems usually when we're talking about modularity. And all these criteria are influenced not only by the logical design, by which I mean the class structure, but also by the physical design, which means uh, by the... It's probably hard to read. <laughs> At least that's... Okay. I don't know. I guess we cannot do anything about that. Sorry. Um, so, for example, it's important uh, in which how you package your interfaces, in which module your interfaces go. It, it, uh, it influences the dependencies between the individual modules. So first I would like to talk about the very, very uh, basic um, types, uh, about the very, very basic um, um, problem domain about uh, managing dependencies, because this is what all the module systems do. And we have some basic uh, uh, types of dependencies that I would like to introduce before we go in more detail. And that's direct dependencies, indirect dependencies. Um, we will talk about cycles. We will talk about incoming versus outgoing dependencies. And uh, Soran is going to talk a little bit about classical design patterns in the context of uh, modular, modular system. So, the impact of a direct dependency is quite obvious. So we have here uh, uh, two modules. Module 2 depends on module 1. So um, a change in module 2 doesn't affect module 1, so it's easy to change. But on the other hand, a change in module 1 may influence module 2. Very simple. If we have an indirect or transitive dependency, um, it's a little bit more complicated uh, because we have um, we have, for example, module 1, which might be an implementation of an interface that is defined in module 2, and module 3 depends on them. So module 3 might be in influenced by module 1. So it's very important that you manage your dependencies, that you know your dependencies, in order to be able to find uh, possible bugs. So when you're looking for uh, the reason of a bug, you can really um, have a good indication uh, by looking at the modules that uh, you directly or indirectly depend on. 